So I think I have both the easiest and the hardest jobs of the day. The easy job is to introduce a man who really needs no introduction. The hard job is that I have to follow him as the next speaker. Um, Alex Sosa is a PhD candidate at Harvard who's working on a small problem you might have heard of called gene editing using advanced CRISPR tools that go well beyond those that were used to win a Nobel Prize. At Harvard, Alex was awarded a scholarship in the highly competitive National Science Foundation's Graduate Research Fellows Program in the Biological and Biomedical Sciences. He works in David Liu's lab, which perhaps is the world's most preeminent lab in prime and base editing. Dr. Liu's published more than 165 papers and is the inventor on more than 60 issued US patents. His research accomplishments have earned many distinctions, including being named one of the top 20 translational researchers in the world by Nature Biotechnology, as one of Nature's top 10 researchers in the world. And his paper on prime editing was named as one of Nature's top 10 remarkable papers. I could keep going with this list, but I think you get the picture. The big news is that Alex and Dr. Liu are bringing gene editing to AHC. I'm proud that this community is now on the cutting edge of science, and I'm excited to listen to this very smart man speak today. Alex. All right, I think everybody can hear me. Uh, let me know if that's not the case. Um, so uh, hello, everybody, and good morning. Uh, Simon, thank you very much for the very, very generous introduction. Um, we're also very excited to be working with uh, the research community here uh, at the AHC Foundation. So this is uh, equally exciting for us as it is exciting for you. Um, as Simon mentioned, I'm Alexander Souza. I'm a PhD candidate in the lab of Dr. David R. Liu at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning, or at least where it's morning for me. Um, all right, so let me just get started. All right. So, uh, all right. Great. So um, I'd just like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak. Um, as Jean mentioned yesterday, we're just getting underway with our research. Uh, but so far, uh, we've already had really great interactions with the community, uh, with Dr. Al George, Kevin S, Simon. Everybody's been really collaborative and really supportive of our own research and getting the air under our wings and getting this project going. That way we can see how we can address um, AHC from a gene editing perspective. And today, I've tried to do my best to uh, gear this talk uh, for families since this is the main audience. Although if anybody has any questions about the more technical side of things, I'm happy to go further in depth as far as you'd like to go in the Q&A session later. Um, what I'm hoping to accomplish today is provide a basic background on what gene editing is, uh, what base editors are and what prime editors are and describe translational work that has been successful with other gene editing approaches that we've done in our own lab uh, specifically in animal models, because as Gene mentioned yesterday, the roadmap is first for us to establish work in cells, then from there move into the available animal models, and then build up the work from AAV gene therapy, which I'm very excited to hear Simon talk about in the next session, frankly, and then from there, you know, see what we can do with translating this into maybe a real therapy. Uh, but we're at the very beginning, so uh, I'll just be giving a background on base editing and prime editing today and hopefully let the families know what, you know, gene editing really is. Fantastic. So um, as the title says, uh, and as it should seem to everybody here, it should be no surprise that human mutations can cause genetic diseases. Um, in this chart here, we have a survey of the different types of mutations associated with human disease. And we can see that many are single DNA letter swaps or deletions. Mutations like these include the CDT mutation in LMNA responsible for hodgkinson gilford progeria the A to T mutation in HPV responsible for sickle cell disease, the three nucleotide deletion in CFTR responsible for cystic fibrosis, and the four nucleotide insertion in HEXA responsible for Tay-Sachs disease. 
I think most important to the discussions this weekend are the mutations present in the ATP 1A3 gene, which are responsible for causing AHC. I have here the three most common AHC causing mutations, but as we all know, it's certainly not an exhaustive list by any means. And there is a variety of mutations that can contribute to um, dysregulation and disruption of the ATP 1A3 gene and eventually the sodium potassium pump that it encodes for. So there are many ways to potentially approach the treatment of genetic disease. And in the gene editing field, our focus obviously is, is investigating how we can edit the gene directly in patients and their cells and their DNA to correct disease causing mutations that may be present and contributing to dysregulation of a protein that the genes make. So one of the first tools in the gene editing community that we had available for editing DNA in cells were programmable nuclease. The most famous and transformative of which is CRISPR-Cas9. The basis of this technology, um, and this technology recently won the Nobel Prize, is that an enzyme, Cas9, can be given a DNA address, and then Cas9 can find this address in cells to cut DNA and disrupt a specified gene. Um, this capability to easily program an enzyme to find, cut, and disable a gene gave scientists a powerful tool for research. However, most disease causing mutations in genes must be corrected rather than disrupted to benefit patients. Turning off an already broken gene is not beneficial in most cases. And instead, the gene editing community uh, would like to precisely correct mutations in genes so that, can, they, so that they can normally function again. A solution to the goal of correcting mutations in, mutations in genes precisely rather than just turning genes off by cutting and disabling them was achieved with the development of C-base editors and A-base editors by our lab. Base editors are built from Cas9 nucleases that cannot cut DNA, but they still have the capacity to find targets in a cell's DNA when given an address. Base editors can find a DNA address in a cell's DNA with a specific mutation, such as this one, and then they can create a small bubble of accessible DNA letters that we call an editing window. From there, they can convert certain DNA letters within that small editing window into other DNA letters. These changes are made and preserved by other enzymes that are attached to the Cas9 protein that we use as a homing device to find an address in the genome of a cell. Uh, C-base editors can convert C to T and G to A, and A-base editors can convert A to G and T to C. Base editing technology gave us the option to edit genes without cutting them offering a chance to precisely correct the underlying mutations of the genetic diseases rather than just turning off genes with a nucleus. So for example, in one report from our lab that was recently published, we set out to correct a pathogenic mutation that was an A mutation that is present in the HBB gene that causes sickle cell disease. You can see the iconic crescent sickle shape of the red blood cells in this photo here. These red blood cells were from samples of blood from mice uh, receiving transplantation of unedited or diseased sickle cell disease patient bone marrow. By using an A-base editor to convert this pathogenic A shown here to a G in sickle cell patient bone marrow, we were able to convert the pathogenic A mutation to a benign G mutation that resulted in healthy red blood cells when a base editor treated bone marrow was transplanted back into animal models. You can see the round and normal shape of the red blood cells that receive the base edited patient bone marrow in this photograph to the right here. This is one example of us trying to translate base editors uh, to an approach where we can actually treat a disease. And in this case, the cells were edited outside of a living system. They were edited in a laboratory and then transplanted back into, um, back into uh, uh, sickle cell disease mice. In another study from our lab, we were able to treat progeria in mice using a base editor. In progeria, a pathogenic T mutation shown here in the element A gene results in, amongst other symptoms, stiffening and thickness of blood vessels in the heart that eventually leads to death. In this photo here to the right, we can see in beige a buildup of stiff tissue or adventitia that accumulates in untreated progeria mice. To correct this mutation and these symptoms, a T needed to be converted to a C in the element A gene. So in this case, we use the base header, which can make a T to C conversion. We use the A-base editor specifically. Uh, <clears throat> base editor machinery was systemically injected into progeria mice by a viral vector 
And in critical tissues like the heart, we saw efficient conversion of this T mutation to an original healthy cDNA letter. Treatment by a single systemic viral vector injection resulted in the reduction of adventitia thickening down to near normal levels, and then the doubling of the recorded lifespan of base editor treated mice. And you can see this kind of doubling right here in this um, Kaplan-Meier curve. Um, but I think the real data that's especially striking is the observation from the study in these videos here. Uh, in this video, uh, we have an untreated progeria mouse. Its fur is unkempt and tufted. The mouse is not moving around a lot. These are hallmarks of very sick mice. And in striking comparison, here is a video of a base editor treated progeria mouse that is healthy and well-groomed. And it's also four months older than this other mouse that was never treated with base editors. Um, this is a pretty striking uh, phenotype genotype relationship and shows that uh, we can demonstrate the capabilities of a well-designed gene editing strategy paired with a good delivery system for both progeria and sickle cell disease. So in principle, we would like to correct the pathogenic mutations in the gene ATP183 responsible for AHC using a base editor, like I've described. Um, for this talk, I'm only going to focus on DE801N as it is the most common mutation that causes AHC, and there is an available mouse model for this mutation, but these principles can be applied to any of the other mutations that are present uh, in the ATP1A3 gene. Um, for the DE801N mutation, a pathogenic A needs to be converted back to a healthy G. To correct the DE801N mutation, we would use an A base editor to find the pathogenic A and then convert it to a G because A base editors make A to G mutations or edits. However, this editing strategy is complicated by the fact that the pathogenic A that needs to be corrected is also besides a healthy normal A in this editing window that I've mentioned before. Because base editors have an editing window where certain letters are converted into other letters, it is possible for this healthy A to be converted into a G just like the pathogenic A needs to be converted into a G when targeted with a base editor. In gene editing, we call these unintended edits, like this one, a bystander edit. Bystander edits, bystander edits were also present in the progeria study and in the sickle cell disease study that I showed. Uh, but they occur either infrequently or they only encoded benign edits that wouldn't affect the final function of the protein. In the case of ATP1A3, DO801N, the, by the bystander edit that I have highlighted here would likely be detrimental to the final function of the ATP1A3 gene. This isn't writing off base editing for ATP1 ATP1A3 uh, DA1N, but the subject of our research that we're doing right now at the Broad is to maximize correction of the pathogenic um, A back to a healthy G while minimizing bystander editing. Uh, we have a lot of strategies to try and do this, and that's something I'm working on right now in the lab with other people in the group. And once we do nail this problem, uh, we'd like to use the lessons that we've picked up from progeria and sickle cell disease for translating base editors into a mouse model, and then also piggyback off of the hard work that's being done by AHC gene therapy uh, studies right now to proceed further into animal models. So on the bright side, base editing also isn't the only tool that we have to work with. In addition to base editing, we have prime editing to treat genetic disease. Uh, we recently developed these, and prime editors enable all possible DNA letter changes, and also the correction of small insertions and deletions. Prime editing doesn't suffer from the effect of bystander, from the effect of bystander edits like base editors. Instead, it works as a programmable search and replace tool to edit DNA letters. Like base editors, prime editors are built from Cas9 from a Cas9 enzyme that cannot cut DNA, but it can still search for a cell's DNA when given an address. The prime editor finds that address in a protein, and then a protein attached to a Cas9 can write in and replace the mutations in a DNA sequence with a different sequence. And this is kind of like find and replace that you're familiar with with a, with a word processor. Um, so prime editors offer an immense level of flexibility in the type of edits that we can make to DNA but it's still a new technology that we are developing in parallel to our more advanced base editor tools that have been proven and shown to work very well in animal models. Our short-term research goals are to find ways to maximize D801N mutation correction using prime editors, 
and then again use the lessons that we learned in translating base editors uh, from progeria and sickle cell projects to translate prime editors also into an animal model and overall also again use the lessons that are currently being learned from AHC gene therapy to proceed further into animal models. As it stands, um, it's still very early and it's too early to commit to either a base editing or a prime editing strategy uh, to correct AHC causing mutations in ATP 1A3. We'll need to conduct more experiments over the coming year to finalize a gene editing strategy that's appropriate for treating AHC at the genetic level. And whether that's a base editing strategy or a prime editing strategy, is not yet to be determined, uh, but we're certainly trying both approaches in parallel. That way we can have the highest chance of success. So kind of in summary, what I'd like to impart is that we had at the beginning of the genome editing field early on programmable nucleases like CRISPR-Cas9 that only cut and disable genes. But this really isn't useful because generally genetic diseases need genes left intact and mutations need to be precisely corrected, not turned off, or not have genes turned off. Base editing allows that, and it corrects disease-causing mutations by rewriting specific DNA letters within a small editing window. We have used base editors successfully to treat progeria and sickle cell disease in mice, and that bodes well for the translatability into a mouse model of HC. However, bystander editing is a challenge at some targets, including the ATP D801N target, where there is a two, where there is a pathogenic A and a healthy A beside each other, and editing the healthy A will be detrimental likely to the function of the ATP 1A3 encoded protein. Prime editors enable all possible DNA letter changes without bystander editings, and they can also correct insertions and small deletions. Um, however, it's a newer technology that we don't have any animal models to build off of, or any animal studies to build off of with experience, and we're still doing our best to actually refine it and make it into a really flexible tool that could potentially be used to target the underlying pathogenic mutations that are present in the ATP 1A3 gene. So um, the road ahead, and I think Gene spelled this out really well for me yesterday during his intro, is you know right now, um, the team that we have working on this, we're working in cells. And these are cells that we've received from the AHC research community very gratefully. Uh, specifically, uh, Simon has connected me with Dr. Al George and Dr. Kevin S um, to get um, actually primary fibroblasts that we'd like to use in the lab for a lot of our editing experiments. And right now we're working on making the most efficient and precise uh, prime and base editing strategies to correct these underlying mutations in the ATP 1A3 gene. Uh, once we do settle on a strategy that we think is the most robust, precise, and safest strategy, uh, then we'd like to build from our previous animal studies with base editors and also the lessons that I hope Simon's gonna talk about in his session in the gene therapy studies to actually go ahead and um, move into animal models, especially the ones that the community here has been able to build. And then finally, um, once we do have uh, these strategies ironed out. Proceed. Oh, 10.45, what time is it? So um, this is just a brief talk. Hopefully I was able to give you guys an idea of what base editing, what prime editing is what we'll be working on, what we're concerned about, and what options that we have to tackle these specific genetic mutations that are present in um, ATP 183. Um, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of people, in particular, Dr. David Liu, my advisor, uh, for you know, introducing me to Simon, and you know, really this entire research community of well-connected and tight-knit uh, scientists, and also awesome families, given the talks that I've heard all day yesterday. Um, Simon, who I brag about to everybody in the lab and also to everybody at Harvard for being one of the best patient advocates and, you know, one of the best connected guys I've ever met. Uh, he, he works very quickly to make sure that there's no barriers on our end uh, for getting access to any of the resources available that have been put together. Um, Lily Whittup is another graduate student who's assisting me on this project. And then, of course, I'd like to talk, thank Dr. Kevin S. for being so generous with his uh, patient samples and also Dr. Alfred George for being very generous with his time um, over email. And obviously everybody else in the lab because I'm not working on this alone. It's a group effort and uh, it, takes a, it takes a lot of people to make something like this happen. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, we've had an immense level of support. Uh, I think Gene really outlined uh, in uh, monetary amounts the amazing work that's been done by the AHCF and also, you know, we get incredible support from Hope for Annabelle as part of this collaboration and also Career HC. And 
as Simon mentioned, I am funded by the NSF. So uh, I really, really want to thank everybody for coming out today and uh, also for giving me a chance to speak as well. And if uh, there are any questions, I'm happy to address whatever questions there might be. Thanks so much, Alex. I'm pretty sure that you just blew everyone away with your presentation, especially the photographs of sickle cells and the videos of the progeria mice before and after the um, your treatment. We are all excited about the possibility of prime editing, especially for DA1N, but also the possibilities of base editing for other mutations in ATP183 and other genes associated with AHC and other rare diseases. There are lots of questions. I will ask some from the chat now. Um, I think we'll probably open it up after that because do we have a little time? I guess we've got a little time. So the first question is, um, since viral vectors may be used for the therapy of our patients in the future um, for both prime editing and base editing and transgene delivery, should patients be careful about which COVID vaccines they use? Um, should they choose vaccines that don't use viral vectors? Do you have any comment on that? Uh, I'm certainly not qualified to answer that in a professional capacity, but my understanding is that um, AAV uh, will be a completely different uh, virus from what you'd be getting with a COVID vaccine. But I would definitely, that's a question that you would take up with a professional physician or a virologist. Um, yeah, and we have a couple of virologists that we could take that one too, but thanks for that question. We, um, we are looking at serotypes of AAVs so that we can make sure that we're not kind of creating immunities as we deliver those. And um, it's an important question. So the next question is from Lauren. If you had to make an educated guess, how many years are we away from, an, from animal and subsequently human trials like the progeria and sickle cell trials? Um, and I can answer a bit of that, Lauren. Um, the intent here is that it's a two-year study that will culminate in testing in, in, in our animal model. So the idea is that we would get to proof of concept in two years if all goes well. And then the path to FDA and beyond that is um, somewhat unpredictable, but it's something like two to four years, depending on the speed of uh, and the data that you can provide. And then the next question is also, would these approaches require bone marrow transplant like sickle cell, or would it be more like the progeria medication trials in our kids? Yeah, I think, um, you know, Simon will go into exactly what the viral vector strategy would be for AHC. And I think, you know, if you have questions about delivery and administration, a lot of the lessons that he'll be learning are things that we're going to be actually copying and just cheating from him. Uh, he has the hard, he said he had the hard, the hard talk today. Uh, he certainly does, I guess. Um, that's the gene therapy studies. We can, for our strategies that we have in mind, we can piggyback off a lot of the lessons that will be learned for the transgene studies. And in that case, um, and Simon, I'll let him speak about what he plans on doing then, but it will be a viral vector uh, and an injection. Yes, um, is my understanding at least. But yeah, um, what you'll see for the gene therapy talk uh, would pretty much be the same thing that we'd end up doing uh, for gene editing, with the exception that the cargo would not be a transgene Instead, it would be, uh, it would, well, it would still be a transgene, but it would be a transgene encoding a base editor or a prime editor to target and correct the gene that is, or it, the tar target and correct ATP1A3 instead of actually delivering a new copy of ATP1A3. But overall, it's the same vector. Yeah. I appreciate you kind of teeing me up, Alex, for the next talk. I hope that I can kind of step up to the ball and swing and miss, but we'll, we'll see. I have, a, I have an empty notepad. I'm ready to take it, so I'm very excited <laughs> for it. <laughs> so the next question is from Miguel. Um, he says, if the ATP 183 mutation isn't one of the most common, does the work that's been done so far get carried to attempt to correct that mutation? Or do lab tests need to be done for each specific mutation? Yeah, we have we have an idea. Uh, well, we know what the other what some of the other mutations are, um, and right now our priority is mutations that we have uh, a robust and workable animal model with. And in this case, that's the DA to one N mutation. Um, we can develop a strategy to correct all of these mutations individually, but it is a process to kind of vet and uh, put together strategies for each each individual mutation. Um, each individual mutation, some are harder and some will be easier. Uh, given the context of sequence around the specific letter change that's present, 
So if there are no bystander edits, for example, um, then that becomes a much simpler target, not necessarily easier target to design a strategy for, but um, we would still have to go through the process of um, designing a strategy, engineering a strategy, verifying a strategy, and then um, the subsequent animal model experiments that we'd have to do as well. Um, but the lessons that we learn at one site um, contribute to lessons that we can carry over into all the other sites. And it only gets easier every time we do it again in a, in a given gene and then for a given target. Perfect. Thank you. That That's very comprehensive. Uh, hopefully, Meredith, that answers your question. If not, just um, type again in the chat and we'll ask the question differently. Um, Josh, yours is a very similar question, so I'll ask that too. Um, so Josh asks, when you say the bystander edit of a healthy A may be detrimental, how does that get determined? Yeah, um, I guess for the sake of not drowning you guys in molecular biology, um, the letters that we have in our DNA uh, encode for individual uh, amino acids. So there's a code under a code. And uh, the easiest way to put it is that given the position of these bystander edits, uh, sometimes the bystander edits can be what we call silent and benign, and they don't actually have an effect on the final outcome of the gene. And for example, that would make a fully functional protein, but given the actual position of the bystander edit, sometime it can have a final function and not be benign and actually have a detrimental effect on the protein. We don't know that until we try it in cells and actually do an experiment with molecular biology, like um, what Dr. Al George spoke about yesterday, or Dr. Sabota uh, would also be an expert in. But uh, we can infer that we'd be making a different protein if we had that bystander edit present, versus um, in some other cases, like for example, in the sickle cell data that I showed, um, that was a benign and silent edit. And that really has to do with just the positioning of the bystander edit and just the natural positions of these other DNA letters in uh, a cell's DNA. There's nothing that we can really do to control it and we have to work around it. And that's what we're doing our best to do right now. And I can comment a little bit on that topic too. Our gene is, is generally highly conserved, which generally means that it can't, it, it can't afford to be changed very much. So when you do start changing these letters um, through bystander effects or otherwise, it can cause um, genetic uh, disease issues pretty easily. So that's something that's that's somewhat unique to our gene, um, given the highly conserved nature. The next um, question, I think, hello, we've covered that. Um, if not, comment again, and I'll ask again. But the timeline for becoming usable on animal models is two years. We've really just started the the work with Harvard Broad, and um, you know they they're making fast progress, but it's there's a lot of work to be done before we start injecting our animal models. Um, so Rachel asks, does this apply to deletions um, or just mutations? That's a great question. Yeah. So uh, with base editing, uh, we don't have the capacity to address deletions. Uh, base editing is best suited for single base uh, mutations. However, with the newer technology that we actually published in 2019, prime editing, we can address multiple mutations at once, and we can also address small deletions and small insertions. So if a patient does have a, a multinucleotide insertion or a multinucleotide deletion uh, within the realm of maybe zero to 20 or zero to 10, uh, we can definitely address that in good conscience and we can design strategies to correct that. And we've done that in the lab and we've shown that in cells um, at other targets that we're capable, we have the capacity to do, that, to do that with prime editing. Perfect. And then Lauren, I'll, I'll try to answer your question um, again. So what would happen would be that we would, we would take this therapy if all goes well, right? Which is obviously a huge caveat. But if all goes well, we would take this therapy and um, go through the regulatory process, the manufacturing process, and deliver a viral vector that carries this, these genetic tools to the right parts of the brain to correct those, the, the DNA in, that, in those parts of the brain. What it is, is a liquid that contains a virus, and that's vir that virus contains the DNA, and that DNA gets delivered to, to and used as, as machinery to make that change. Um, I'll talk a, a bit more about how that is delivered in my talk, 
so um you know i'm going to try to keep you around to, to listen to that but um i think afterwards you should have a good idea about how that would actually work mechanically in terms of injections and, and where that injection would take place and then we do have a little more time so miguel asks is there a database where we could help the scientific community um, to register our genetic reports for specific cases the yes we do have a database miguel um, i'm maintaining that at the moment we've got 140 or so patients in that database with their genetic mutation and um, that is a very good way to qualify patients for clinical trials that may come out of these thera therapeutic research papers and um I think it, you know, it's my opinion, but I think it's it's very important for everybody to to share their genetic mutations as a qualification uh, to to qualify kids for for these type of therapies. I think that's it, um, Bill. If you want to open up to everybody else, it looks like we have another few minutes. And thanks again, Alex. No problem at all. Thank you very much, Simon. Looking forward to your talk. How are you, Josh? Well, I have a round. <laughs> Indiana's behind everybody, but I have 1033. Um, I don't think our next talk is for another 15 minutes or so, isn't it? So we do have a couple, we do have some more time for questions. Um, I had one. Uh, when, and, the, and this may be a addressed in your talk, Simon, but like when these genes get corrected, how does that correction get distributed throughout the body for therapy? Is it, is it through cell regeneration or um, is, are these, I mean, our, our goal is that these therapies would affect kids of any age, not just, um, you know, prenatal kind of kids. Yeah, um, I think the, from at least from us in the gene, edit, gene editing world, uh, we are uh, kind of limited by the tropism or the cell specificity of the viral vector that's used. And, you know, Simon, I imagine we'll talk about it, but we have to pick the best viral vector that we can for hitting the most important uh, tissue for uh, correcting and ameliorating disease. So um, in the case of going into the brain, there will be an AV uh, serotype or AV, I guess, species, or, or so to speak, that um, will be best suited for hitting the types of cells that will give the most therapeutic benefit for the patient. Um, and that viral vector will determine what cells get hit. And then that will be where the transgene for gene editing in this case will go and correct DNA and hopefully provide the most therapeutic benefit. Um, but uh, with the type of tropism that you pick, with the type of injection that you pick, with the type of viral dose that you pick, um, and again, I don't wanna speak for Simon because he knows as much better than me. I'm a gene editor, not a delivery person. Um, uh, you will be able to pick or dictate what cells uh, are edited and how well edited they can be in some capacity. And Simon, please correct me if I'm misspeaking on any of this. No, so that, that's really great information the, i would summarize it just by saying it's about the delivery method and the serotype so the serotype is what is is designed to deliver to specific cells so in the case of av9 and av2 that's to neurons um, so you know the the idea would be you inject close to your target cells and you inject many billions in this case it's one times 10 to the 14 viral genomes per milliliter, which is an enormous number, um, into the um, CSF of patients. And those viruses would go individually to cells and um, deliver the, the genetic machinery. So both where you, de where you deliver it and um, the type of virus that you engineer to deliver it, those are the two, um, the, the two things you need to decide on precisely. Um, so that you can target the cells you're after. And in this case, I think the question was also about kind of the rest of the body. We know that AHC has a phenotype, not just in neurons, um, but neurons are really the, the problem area for a lot of the AHC phenotype. Catherine asks a very good question and a related question, Catherine Bale. 
Um, she says, we still don't know fully the genotype to phenotype correlation in different mutations. Um, there's some correlation, but still a lot of individual variations. How do we feel this will factor into gene therapy and base editing research in terms of clinical outcomes for patients? Yeah, um, I think, you know, we have the luxury in the gene editing world of being focused on genotype. Um, and then we do the best that we can to correct the genotype that we are given. And that's why we run the animal model studies to see when given a genotype, given our best college effort to actually correct that genotype, how does that dictate outcomes on the phenotype side? Um, so uh, I would say, you know, I, I, don't, I don't consider phenotype. When I look at cells that have a given mutation, I consider how can I correct the genotype as best I can. And then we leave that to the further studies to see what the effect is in the phenotype. So we wouldn't be able to correlate those two uh, without uh, a study. So um, we have another excellent question here. How quickly will there be noticeable changes? Do you have any feel for that from your um, current or, or prior research, Alex? Uh, absolutely not. <laughs> that would be uh, that would be very dependent on mutation and the dose and the delivery. And again, we have the luxury and the privilege of following up on gene therapy studies to help us inform that. And that's the best bet that we can take. Um, so everything that we do in gene editing and on the, I, honestly, basically everything that we do in gene editing these days has been built off the, the trials and errors of gene therapy studies, uh, which have come before gene editing. Uh, and we have that luxury, thankfully, to help direct our own experiments and make them much more effective. Can you speak to at least the the time on the progeris model, like, I mean, it's probably not a Disney princess at midnight where everything changes in 30 seconds, but can you speak to the progeris effect once they were treated? Yeah, they were injected at P14 uh, and I wasn't there handling the mice. Uh, I mean, best, the best data that I have, because I didn't run that ex the set of experiments is you can see the Kaplan-Meier curve, you can see how the mice looked. I'm sure as they went through this degenerative kind of effect um, over time, you could see that they were doing better than their cohort of, uh, of saline injected and untreated mice. So it would be progressive, or I guess it would be over time, but I don't know, it's, very, it's very difficult to equate what you would see in a person to what you see in a mouse. And then also to draw comparisons, I think between progeria sure. and sickle cell, um, but uh, it would be not overnight for sure. I mean, it takes time for these edits to happen. We can see them at the genotype level happening pretty quickly, but then um, in the phenotype uh, area, it could take the order of months maybe, but it's it's really hard to say. And also weird to give a number on it too. So it's, it's sure. yeah. Thanks. We have three other very good questions. I don't think we have any more time for questions. The three questions are, how the heck do we pay for this? Which is a great question. Um, another one is, um, should I check my child for her type of mutation? And the answer is yes. And then the last question is, um, actually there are a couple more popping up, but is an animal model required for each mutation? Yes, it, we, we really do need that in this case, not necessarily in transgene delivery, which I'll talk about a bit. And then the last thing, do we expect gene therapy to address ancillary issues like coordination and speech or just address the episodes? It's very hard to know what, maybe you can go ahead, Alex, but um, I'll say kind of from my reading that it's hard to know what, what type of effects a therapy will have on an existing phenotype. Um, what we're trying to do here is address especially cerebellar issues. And those two issues you just described, coordination and speech, are very cerebellar. So we would be targeting that. Alex, do you want to add to that? I would say that we'd have to see what the animal model can tell us. And that just kind of speaks to the power and uh, I guess the utility of these animal models that you guys have done a really great job of putting together for the research community. So um, we'll make our best inferences from there. And once we have that data, uh, we would have a better answer for that kind of question. But right now, I wouldn't know at all. And then just back to the cost question quickly, I know I skipped over that and kind of joked about it a little bit, but we do have strategies to pay for this. This is not something that is kind of, 
once there is proof of concept and the number of people that we have, especially with a DA to one N mutation, this is not kind of an N of one disease where it's very kind of precise medicine. This can be used for many patients. And especially in the case of DA to one N, where you know thirty-five percent of more than a thousand patients around the world really could benefit from this. We um, we have something that is is attractive to to pharmaceutical companies to manufacture and also is obviously um, going to change people's lives and would be something that insurance would would get behind um, and has got behind in, in many cases of similar genetic therapies. Okay, I think we got to the end of the questions. All right. Um... Thank you very much, uh, Simon. Uh, it's a pleasure always to get in a Zoom chat with you. Uh, thank you very everybody else. Uh, this has been a really great weekend and I look forward to hearing what's going on for the rest of the day. Thank you again, Alex.